take my breath away. But um, but um, oh. Oh, 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 wait, wait, hi, everybody. A live mic again? When will he ever learn? Welcome back to another exciting AMP lab. This one, lab number five, the respiratory system. Practical number one is done. All of that cardiovascular stuff, the blood vessels, the heart parts, never to be seen again here in lab. So we're starting fresh the second half of the semester with the respiratory system. Now, depending on where you are in your lecture, you have most likely already covered the respiratory system and its physiology and a good bit of the anatomy in your lecture. If you have not, the lab will help you. If you already have, the lecture will help you. That's just the way it works. We can never match up perfectly. We can only come close, do sort of an approximation. Couple nice things about lab number five. First, the respiratory system does not have that much anatomy in it. You see as you look at your lab manual. It is definitely light on histology. compared to the other labs we have upcoming, six and eight in particular. And the physiology is not really that complicated. So essentially what we have in this lab is the respiratory anatomy, which I have a lot of nice models for. And this is an organ system that doesn't really even have that many organs in it. Starts up here at your nose, ends about at your diaphragm, because the rest of it, of course, is that systemic gas exchange, which you probably already studied in your lecture. Then we have a little bit, just a taste of histology. Then we have some spirometry, the measuring of lung volumes, which you'll get to watch me do right over there from where I sit. And some conclusion questions that really, if you can remember that everything is related to, contingent on, dependent on, tied to blood carbon dioxide levels, your life will get a lot easier in those conclusion questions. So let's get ourselves started on the anatomical structures, page one, for the human respiratory system. Okay, people, what you're looking at here is, of course, the classic head and shoulders model. You saw this one before. Lab two, we saw it. We'll see it here in lab five again as well. This particular model will best serve us in a sagittal section. So if I simply remove half of this model, I can see some of the structures we will start with in lab number five. And if I do just a tiny bit of camera work here to zoom in on this sagittal section of the head, we can look at some of the respiratory structures listed in lab number five Join me, if you will, on page one. So the first thing we see is a pair of structures called nares. Don't say nares. No, 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 don't say nares. That's just reminiscent of a hair removal product, right? You can go ahead and wear short shorts, but we have nares, not nares. That's a common American mispronunciation of the term. So the two nares we have are our holes at the front and rear of the human nasal cavity. So if I straighten him out just a touch for us so I can get my hand in here, this is the nasal cavity. 
I have just inserted my probe through one of the external nares. This would be your nose hole, your nostril. The thing through which you insert your finger when you are picking your nose. And just a free piece of advice, please, some of you stop picking your nose when you take a lab quiz online or a lecture test online because Respondus Monitor catches that. External nares. Two of them, I just happen to have one because I have torn off the other half of this particular model. The internal nares would be holes that I want you to sort of envision right back here at the posterior side of the nasal cavity. You can't really see one unless you were to orient the model in such a way that you had a frontal section right through here, right through the adenoids or pharyngeal tonsils. So the internal nares would be right here. So if I indicated this on a lab quiz or practical and said name the hole found here, internal nares is what you would have to put. Inside the nasal cavity we have some of our old friends the nasal conche or turbinate bones, one, two, three, superior, middle, inferior. You might remember them from your first semester course when you studied the skull. <clears throat> so let me be very clear here with you and my probe in this close-up view. Here we have the superior nasal concha, singular. Here we have the middle nasal concha. And here we have the inferior nasal concha. Superior, middle, inferior nasal conchas. And between them, is where we find the meatuses, the tunnels, the canals. You can see three. One, two, three. Of course, in order from bottom to top, the inferior nasal meatus. Most people just say inferior meatus. The middle meatus and the superior meatus. So one, two, three, conche or conches, and one, two, three, meatuses. The meatuses are the tunnels or the canals through which the air has to move. So as a person inhales, these conche or turbinate bones create a lot of turbulence which slows that air down and then it has to sort of flow through these tunnels. That's what allows us a chance to warm the air, moisten it a little bit, a few of those respiratory fizz things. This is the nasal cavity, the entire structure. Conche, nares, the meatuses that you see here. Let me show those things to you on a few other models, but as long as we're here, let's take a look at a few of the things that we can see without even having to move this model. If you look right here where my probe is running, you can see a bony roof to our oral cavity, floor to our nasal cavity, right here. This bony structure is, of course, known as our hard palate. That's the next anatomical structure you see. The hard palate, part of your skull, the bony elements, made up mostly by the maxilla, the bone in which our upper teeth live, and a small section back here of the palatine bone. So what we have, and I will zoom way in here for you, 
to see it maybe a little clearer. If you look very close, I bet you can see a suture right here connecting these two bones. This is the palatine bone. Everything anterior to this is the maxilla. So this is called the palatine process of the maxilla. This is called the palatine bone. Don't confuse the two. It's easy to do that, but you have to remember how we learned some structures back in the first semester. Do you remember the zygomatic arch, which was made of the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone? So we call this section of the maxilla the palatine process because it's making a joint with the palatine bone. So palatine bone, palatine process of the maxilla. Those are the two structures of the hard palate that I can ask you. Looking at this sagittal head, I can see the same structures. I think it's not that bad for us. It doesn't really matter what model I use, the structures look so similar. So notice over here, external nares, nose hole, nostril. I can see the superior, middle, and inferior conches, or conche. I can see the inferior, middle, and superior meatuses. I can also see, maybe not quite as well on this model, the palatine bone and palatine process of the maxilla making up the hard palate. This one does not have a suture that's quite as nice as the first model we saw. And you'd want to look for one with a nice suture so you could separate those two skeletal elements from one another. But as long as we're here in this sagittal section, follow along with me in your lab manual. What do we call this structure that's behind the hard palate right here? This is the soft palate. You see it listed there on page one, sort of toward the left-hand side. So, just to keep you focused in on what's possible for me to ask you, the way I could ask questions. So these major structures of the respiratory system, I could ask you the whole thing. I could put dots all across this and say, what is this? hard palate. What's this specific part of it? The palatine bone. What's this specific part? Palatine process. This structure right here, the whole thing behind the bone, is called the soft palate. The little punching bag, the end of it right here where my probe is, that is the uvula. That little punching bag structure we have at the back of our throat is not a tonsil. I remember telling you that before. That is the uvula right there at the tip of my finger. Hard palate, soft palate, uvula. Let's try another one and again notice the great similarities here. External nares. Internal would be right back here. Difficult to see, but on a quiz I could make a circle there. I could animate one in or say name the hole found here. Internal nares. Superior, middle, inferior conches. Superior, middle, inferior meatuses. Hard palate. Soft palate, uvula, right there. Look at all three of these sagittal models and think about those structures that you see as we go through this. Also, I want you to notice, as long as we're looking at this thing, the sinuses. 
the nasal sinuses, or rather I should say skull sinuses. I can see two of them quite nicely on this model. One here and one here, this whole thing. This is the frontal sinus right here. This is the sphenoidal sinus right here. These hollow spots in our skulls named for the bones they live in. Let's look at this model again. I can see the frontal sinus right here, sphenoidal sinus right there. These hollow spots in our skulls are resonance chambers for our vocal noises. Haven't you ever noticed, perhaps, how when a person is sick or they have a cold, if you fill up one of these things with fluid or mucus, it changes how your voice sounds, doesn't it? So looking back at our original model, I can see the sphenoidal sinus right here, frontal sinus right there, hollow spots in our skulls. On this model, I can also see again that soft palate right here with the uvula being the very end of the thing. There are a few other structures we can see from these very same models in this sagittal section. And those structures are listed in your lab manual, again, on page one, toward the left. These are structures of your pharynx. These are structures of the pharynx. The pharynx is that area of your respiratory system where the nasal cavities and oral cavities meet one another. So the pharynx starts up here where that internal narus is located and extends down to here where the glottis, the hole at the top of your trachea is located. So this whole region here between my fingers, this is your pharynx. I always tell people, and rightly so, in my humble opinion, and there's nobody here to argue with me, <coughs> excuse me, because I'm alone in the lab, and you just heard me clear my throat, that was staged. Because when you clear your throat, what are you clearing? <coughs> your pharynx. The pharynx is the place where you hawk up a loogie, for those people who might know what hawking up a loogie is. Your pharynx is the place where you speak certain languages, German in particular, <coughs> has a lot of pharyngeal noises in it, as do some other languages. The pharynx is the place where if you watch one of these online labs as you're taking a sip of your favorite drink and I say something that's so hilariously funny, ha ha ha, you laugh and then the drink squirts out your nose, shoots right out of this external nares, singular one, shoots right out of that liquid had to pass through your pharynx. So the pharynx, to get back to my original point, in my anatomical opinion, it's not really a structure, it's a location. I can't really go into your neck and rip your pharynx out like I could some other structures. I can't dissect your pharynx out of you. All I can do is make it bigger or plug it up. So it's this region right here. And there are some structures in the pharynx that are worth, I guess I would say, looking at or taking note of. First and foremost would be the three regions that we have of the pharynx. I will zoom in a little bit for you. I think I can do it as your camera operator right here. There we go, perfect. 
So the three regions of your pharynx are the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Naso, oro, laryngo. And of course these are related to anatomical structures we find there. So the nasopharynx is the region from your internal nares or posterior nares to your uvula. Here to here. And trust me, this would be fairly easy for me to describe to you in or on a lab quiz or practical because I can just draw in lines from here to here between my two fingers. This is the nasopharynx. The oropharynx, as you see written right there in your lab manual, is from your uvula to your epiglottis. The epiglottis is this cartilaginous structure right here, the flap that closes the top of your trachea. So from here to here between my fingers now, so as soon as I see this epiglottis, oropharynx is done. So oropharynx goes from the tip of the uvula to the top of the epiglottis. Oropharynx. Laryngopharynx is from the epiglottis to what? The epiglottis to the esophagus or we could say also the top of your trachea, this region right here. Laryngopharynx. Nasopharynx. Oropharynx. Go over that a few times it would be fairly easy for me to indicate with some shading or lines. Nasopharynx till I get to this uvula. Oropharynx till I hit the epiglottis. Laryngopharynx till I get right here where the trachea's opening is found and the start of your esophagus. The three regions of your pharynx. The other structure that you're responsible for here in the pharynx is the opening for the auditory tube or the opening of or the opening to the auditory tube which is this structure right here. We actually have, you might recall from way back when when you studied hearing, studied hearing a tube that goes from here to your middle ear to allow us to equalize pressure on either sides of our eardrum. This is the opening to the auditory tube or eustachian tube. It's right here at the top of the what? Nasopharynx. Let's look at it on a couple other models. The sagittal model is very good for many of these structures. Again, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. And as a simple review, let's take a look. The regions of the pharynx, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. Opening of the auditory tube right there. Look just above that soft palate on most of these models and you will see it. Let me grab one other and notice with the respiratory structures it doesn't really matter what model I show you they are similar enough that I do not really see big problems for you on a quiz or a practical with these structures in your head. So, here we have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and a very nice opening to the auditory tube right here where the tip of my pointer is found. Right there. I hope you can see it well. So, these are structures of your pharynx. 
Now, if you're in my lectures, you've already heard this. Do not let me catch you people ever, ever, ever saying Farnix. Look at where the Y is. Look at way, the way the word is spelled. You do not now, nor have you ever had a Farnix. You have a pharynx, you have a larynx. So no such thing as a pharynx, no such thing as a larynx. Maybe I'll even put it in there spelled incorrectly on the quiz just to see if somebody takes it. It's that big a pet peeve of mine. So don't do it. On page one, the left-hand side, there are two things that I have not shown you yet, which are skeletal elements structures that help separate our nasal cavity into two halves, one left, one right. So I kept this other side of my head and shoulders model in reserve because it's probably the best view I have of these two bony structures. What I have is first the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone here in 10. Don't confuse it with the blue stuff. That's all cartilage. So here I have the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. If I have a dot on that, I could ask you, name the bone, ethmoid bone. I could say, name the structure, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. This thing right here, the lower half of this skeletal wall, is called the vomer. Notice how it makes a strikingly similar shape to a sideways or a tilted letter V. That's a study hint for you. This is the vomer, the vertical vomer. Remember that from your study of the skull way back when. Perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the vomer. And look, here again is that frontal sinus. Here's that sphenoidal sinus and so on. Very nice palatine process of the maxilla. I can see palatine bone, all of that stuff. So make sure you're reviewing it up here in the skull. We actually have so many larynx models here in the lab that you could say, I've got larynxes literally coming out of my ears. But um bum Now, why the admittedly pretty lame state gag? And trust me, I got a million of them, and they don't get any better than that. It's not just that Professor Allner has been spending too much time by himself in the 224 lab. It's because I have a large variety of larynx or laryngeal models, which are next up in our anatomical study. But essentially, what we have are two types of larynx models. First, a larynx model that shows me primarily only the cartilage elements of this larynx or voice box. I've got a couple of very nice ones that we'll be looking at. And then another series of larynx models like this one that happen to show me both the cartilage elements and the ligaments in addition to the vocal folds. So we have to use both types. But once you master one of each type, you'll be well prepared for the lab quiz or practical. So one style has the membranes or ligaments on it. The other style does not. We will look at both. And I brought over one of the sagittal heads I'm going to zoom in on it for a minute for you.
and just to let you in on a little secret, if I was to ask you anything about the larynx from a sagittal skull, it would only be the following. I could ask you the epiglottis, which is this thing right here, or I could ask you the vocal cord and fold, vestibular fold here. But you can see those just the same on this model, just a little larger. So I will not ask you the various cartilaginous elements in a sagittal section head like this one. I would have to use one of my specific larynx models for that. Hey, do you know how shoes go together in a shoe box? Heel toe, heel toe like this. So the wide part of one shoe is with the narrow part of the other and the same thing on the other end. Yes, these are actually my shoes today. Normally in lab I don't take off my shoes to show students this, but hey, I'm here by myself so I can engage in slightly impolite behavior. Think about this when we look at those cartilages. So I would like you to consider this larynx model right here. And remember, we say larynx. It shows me the pieces of cartilage. I see a hyoid bone up here as a point of reference. And I can see the trachea down here because of its incomplete rings of hyaline cartilage. This particular style of model does a very good job of showing me the cartilaginous elements of the larynx, the voice box. Now, what does this have to do with my pair of shoes? Well, I want you to notice first these two primary pieces of hyaline cartilage. The upper one, much larger, this is the thyroid cartilage. In fact, I can see on it this part that pokes forward, sometimes called the Adam's apple, the thyroid prominence or laryngeal prominence, laryngeal prominence, right here, the Adam's apple. This whole piece of cartilage right here is the thyroid cartilage. And I want you to notice how it is very large here in the front and a little narrower in the back. This lower piece of cartilage right here, let me rotate it, the cricoid cartilage, which is actually the only one that makes a complete circle, notice how it's narrow in the front and much wider in the back. So this arrangement of heel to toe, heel to toe of these two pieces of cartilage make what some people refer to as a box, a voice box. So the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage right here. Let me show them to you again in a frontal view on this model. And all models of this type look the same. They just might have slightly different colors. Thyroid cartilage laryngeal prominence, cricoid cartilage, right here. This thing that you see flopping around right back here is the epiglottis. Hinged on the anterior side of your voice box, it's connected right up here, and it flops down this way when you swallow some food, so the food goes into the esophagus, which is posterior. So this thing right here is the epiglottis. I like this model because they make it a slightly different color because this one's a slightly different tissue. The epiglottis happens to be much more like elastic cartilage than hyaline, which the others are. So epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. Big three that you see here. Now, let me give you a warning, because it happens every semester. Trust me. If I show students a larynx model like this one, 
and I indicate this thing, the epiglottis, somebody always calls it the tongue every semester. I would bet somebody this semester will. This is not your tongue. This thing is your hyoid bone. Your tongue would be way up there somewhere, wouldn't it? But I can see how this looks somewhat tongue-like. So this is not a tongue. This thing is the epiglottis. So again, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage that you see right here. And if I turn this model around, I can see the other cartilages. These happen to be paired cartilages. I can see the very small right here. Notice this. Right here, the tip. See how there's a fissure right there? This is called the corniculate cartilage. My dopey memory trick is, I always remember it looks sort of shaped like a piece of candy corn or a kernel of corn, the corniculate cartilage right there. And this much larger piece below it is the arytenoid cartilage, the A1, if you don't like the pronunciation. I usually say arytenoid cartilage right here. So arytenoid cartilage corniculate cartilage, that's the epiglottis again. This that I see large on the back is the cricoid. Here is the thyroid cartilage. So I've got several cartilaginous elements. Thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, epiglottis, corniculate, and arytenoid cartilage. I also have some ligaments that hold these things together and some vocal folds, which believe it or not are also ligaments, but I don't see those well on this model. I need the other version of the model for those. So notice this model of a larynx, which looks a little more filled out and a little more detailed, but use as your anchor point anatomically that hyoid bone that I can see right here or perhaps this great big thyroid cartilage. Testosterone, the more we have and we all have it, makes this thing a little larger. That's why we associate the laryngeal prominence being larger in males because of a greater amount of testosterone. A lot of receptors for testosterone in this cartilage right here, the thyroid cartilage. But here's the hyoid bone, here's the thyroid cartilage. This happens to be half of your thyroid gland. Remember that down the road when we do the endocrine system. So what we have is a ligament right here. I can see all of this material that connects the hyoid bone with the thyroid cartilage called the thyrohyoid ligament. This is all the thyrohyoid ligament. The other model did not have that, did it? Same thing on this model. Notice that great big thyroid cartilage. Got a few muscles laid in here as well, but the hyoid bone, thyrohyoid ligament. Once you know the model style, they all sort of look the same. The other ligament I have is smaller. I can see it right here connecting the cricoid cartilage with the thyroid cartilage. This is called the cricothyroid ligament. Let me just grab another larynx model that I happen to have. So here I have the thyrohyoid ligament right there. And right here, the cricothyroid ligament, connecting these different pieces of what? Hyaline cartilage to one another. This model also shows me on the back 
an arytenoid cartilage and a small little corniculate cartilage. If I look at the back of this one, that's not represented very well. But what these models can show me, as well as the sagittal section of my heads can show me this as well, they all look just the same, are what we call the vocal ligaments or vocal folds. Now, I'm going to try to show you this in two dimensions here as well as I can. So notice this thing right here, that's the epiglottis. And I see one, the shelf right here, and two, the fold above it right there. These are the vocal folds. They're actually a pair of ligaments. The true vocal fold or the vocal cord so in your lab manual, you will call this one the shelf that my probe is on right here. This is the vocal fold. Above it, this crease you see in the model right here, this is the vestibular fold. So on these models, notice that the vocal fold is much larger, horizontally oriented. It's a shelf, sometimes has a little white shading on it. Let's look at another model. It's the same thing. What's this one? Vocal fold. What's this one? Vestibular fold. And of course, I can easily have an enlarged version of this for a quiz or a practical. Vocal fold. Vestibular fold. These are parts of what? Your larynx. Remember, you must say larynx. So what can I ask you? The cartilages, the ligaments, and the folds. But once you know a model with the ligaments on it, and look over there by the model without the ligaments, I have several versions of each, but they all look just the same. So spend your time practicing. Next up, we have the trachea and several of its branches, sometimes what we call the bronchial tree or the endotracheal tree. Lots of tree references here. And I think you can understand why if I just show you quickly one of our models upside down why people like to call this the respiratory tree. So I've got several models of this that we will look at, but the naming here is fairly straightforward and I think pretty easy for us. So here we have the two lungs, which we'll be going over in a moment, but I will remove the lungs and the heart so that we can see a few parts of this trachea. I can see just a hint of it right here. Notice the rings of hyaline cartilage that I can see. And then as we go down in the thorax, we of course need this trachea, if we were following air on its way in, to branch to go to each lung. So you can see these two branches of the trachea. These are the primary bronchi. So on my anatomical model, this being the left side, this is the left primary bronchus. And that makes this one the right primary bronchus. And the primary bronchi, plural, will branch into here and here, secondary bronchi. Over here, you can see a secondary bronchus. 
and another secondary bronchus right there. So the trachea branches into primary bronchi, left and right. The primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi. And what do you suppose the secondaries branch into? If you're looking at your list, tertiary bronchi here, here, here. So a branch off the trachea is a primary bronchus. A branch off a primary bronchus is a secondary bronchus. And a branch off the secondary bronchus is a tertiary bronchus, you can see there. It goes like that, continuing down to smaller and smaller till I finally get to terminal bronchioles. Let me just show you that on a slightly more colorful model. See if I can do a little camera work for us. Same idea here, just maybe kind of easy to see with the black background. So here's the trachea. Left and right primary bronchi. These would be secondary bronchi. And then see the branches off the secondary bronchus. These would be tertiary bronchi. Primary bronchus secondaries, tertiaries. Let's look at a couple more models while we're at it, just for fun. Here we have a lung model I like to use to show the lung's lobes, but I can also use it, I think, to show you these bronchi. So let me remove the anterior lung so I can see the trachea right here, which branches into what? a left and right primary bronchus. The primary bronchus has branches here, here, here. These are secondary bronchi. The secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi. Let's try one more model. So look at this thoracic model. Let me take the lungs off. I think you can see again here the trachea, left primary bronchus, right primary bronchus. The primary bronchi have branches coming off them which are secondary bronchi. And the secondary bronchi have coming off them tertiary bronchi. Primary, secondaries, can't see tertiaries over here, and I can see a few of them out here on this particular model. Next up in the anatomy portion, we have the parts of the lungs themselves. So you can see in my model the right lung here and the left lung there. But notice that these two lungs, I think you can see pretty easily on this model, are not equal or symmetrical with regard to how many pieces or parts they have. Can you see that the right lung has one, two, three lobes in it, while the left lung only has two? And of course, we name these lobes. So if we just look at the left lung, we have a superior lobe right here, inferior lobe right there. They are separated by a big crease or dent in the organ called a fissure, just like we had with your brain, you might remember. And since this one falls at such a steep angle, this is an oblique fissure. So superior lobe, inferior lobe, oblique fissure in the left lung. So this is the left oblique fissure. This is the 
left superior lobe. This is the left inferior lobe, and that's the way you'll write your names when you take a quiz or a practical. Or I guess in an online sense, I should say this is the way you'll select your names. Notice over here on my model's right side, three lobes, superior, middle, and inferior lobes. Let me say that again. Superior lobe right here, middle lobe right there, inferior lobe down at the bottom. And of course, we have right and left again here, the right superior lobe, the right inferior lobe. Most people just say the middle lobe because righty has one, lefty does not. So the names for your quiz or your practical, right superior lobe, middle lobe, right inferior lobe. But since this right lung has one, two, three lobes, that requires two fissures to separate them, doesn't it? I can see this one over here at an angle. This is the right oblique fissure. This one that separates the right superior from the middle lobe, this is the horizontal fissure. So, to be clear, as clear as I can be, right superior lobe, middle lobe, right inferior lobe, horizontal fissure, right oblique fissure. Remember, if they have two of them, you got to tell me if it's right or left here with the lungs. And before I leave this model, let me pop this lung off and try to just remind you of something. Do you see this blood vessel right here? We would call in lab number two, the pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk. What color is it? It's blue. Remember, the pulmonary vessels are backwards with regard to color coding. We're going to see that on a model right next door. So notice this lung model, again, showing me the left lung with two lobes, the right lung with three lobes. So just naming for fun. Left superior lobe, left inferior lobe, left oblique fissure. On the model's other side, right superior lobe, the middle lobe, because there's only one, right inferior lobe, right there, horizontal fissure, right oblique fissure. Let's slide over and look at this model, which is also fairly decent. I can see the two lungs, left superior lobe, left inferior lobe, left oblique fissure. I hope that's fairly easy. Right superior lobe, horizontal fissure, middle lobe, right oblique fissure, right inferior lobe of the lung. The next thing we have are some of the arteries and veins that we find in the lung. And again, before I let this heart fall out, remember pulmonary arteries are blue. The blood has not been oxygenated yet. So if I look here over on the right side, I can see blood vessels, which ones in pulmonary circulation would be the arteries? The blue ones. Segmental arteries, the red ones, segmental veins. Remember, we sent the blood into this lung to pick up the oxygen. 
So the color coding is reversed here. Blue blood vessels, segmental arteries. Red ones, segmental veins. And trust me, there are hundreds of different segmental arteries and veins in a lung. You just have to remember segmental arteries are the blue ones, segmental veins are the red ones. Same thing over here. Notice all these red segmental veins and blue segmental arteries. Keep that straight and we will be going over that in the practice video. What you're looking at here is an isolated model. I have a few of these in the lab. Here's one of them right here that a lot of times people struggle with a little bit because I know it's kind of strange looking. So I thought I would put it here in a still figure and you can see the two things that you're responsible for on this particular model and a lead in to the histology section. So remember we have that endotracheal or bronchial tree where the trachea branches into primary, then secondary, then tertiary, quaternary, quintanary, we could go on and on and on, different little bronchioles, until we finally get down here to what you saw in lecture, the air sacs where pulmonary gas exchange happens. So notice the arteries and veins, the capillaries smothering these air sacs. So each one of these individual bags is an alveolus. So here's an alveolus right here. There's one right there. That's what these things all are. And in a real live lung, you wouldn't be able to see any of these because they would all be smothered over with these blood vessels. And I can see a few cut open over here. So just regular simple squamous epithelium making the you know, respiratory membrane with a capillary on it. This is all lecture stuff that you hopefully saw. And we would have, let me go a little bigger here, right here, a bronchiole leading into these things. So this section of the bronchial tree that I'm shading in right here, let me change up colors, maybe you can see it a little better, right there, that's a terminal bronchiole leading into the alveoli. Now the reason I want you to look at these mo this model, some people struggle with it, notice that if you see a bronchiole, a terminal bronchiole, you're also going to see a whole bunch of alveoli in the same histological section. So when we look at these slides next, you will see in cross section, say a structure, maybe it looks something like this. Oh, it just disappeared. That's interesting. All right, let's put it over here somewhere. You might see a bronchiole, you know, say shaped like that, B for bronchiole. And then it's going to be surrounded by all these alveolar sacs in cross section. So you'll see both of them at the same time. And what I'll attempt to do in the histology section is show you how to tell one from the other in the slide of a lung. So you'll see both alveoli and a bronchiole. So look for that in the histology section. Now moving on into some histology of the respiratory system. And there's an often used phrase, it doesn't get any better than this. Well, that definitely applies to this first micrograph that we are looking at. This is a slide of the trachea. So if you were on page two, of your lab manual looking at the histology. I could show you this slide right here and say, name the organ. Your response would be trachea, of course. This is a cross-section of your windpipe. 
showing me the pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium in many individuals, some of the first cells that might be attacked by the coronavirus, I can also see a beautiful layer of hyaline cartilage. The combination of these two tissues, the pseudostratified columnar epithelium and the hyaline cartilage, tells me for sure that this is a trachea slide I am looking at. In addition to name the organ, what can I ask you? Well, only the boldface terms. I could ask you for goblet cells or the incomplete ring of hyaline cartilage. Now, if I just jump up in magnification, I think that you can see quite well, quite easily. In fact, this particular slide, I will only give myself credit for finding it and focusing on it. I will give the tech who created it all the credit for this beautiful, beautiful staining job that we see here. So notice these somewhat clearer blue goblet cells all over in the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. The air would be right here where my hand is. And this gorgeous incomplete ring of hyaline cartilage. This is a trachea slide. Again, name the organ, trachea. Name the structure, incomplete ring of hyaline cartilage. Name the structure, specific cell here. Those would be the goblet cells. Beautiful, beautiful trachea slide for us right there. So just a slightly different section of the same trachea. So again, notice the pseudostratified columnar epithelium with the occasional goblet cells, the mucus makers, and the incomplete ring of hyaline cartilage, the trachea. Okay, here we have a slide of a human lung showing us a couple things. First, I can see all these air sacs, each one of which is an alveolus. So these are alveoli. You see that in your histology section. So any of these I indicate, notice they have a single layer of cells surrounding them. Simple squamous epithelium here. So each one of these is one of my alveoli. I can also see two pretty good bronchioles. You also see that on your list. Bronchioles. Small versions of bronchial tubes. Notice how you recognize these. Of course, a much thicker lining I see than the alveolus. And this is actually pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So it stains fairly dark. Notice this somewhat irregular looking surface characteristic of bronchioles. So I have two nice bronchioles there. I can also see what looks like some particulate matter here, the dark carbon looking spots. Now, that does not mean that this person was a smoker. If they were a smoker, their lungs would probably look much worse than this. Nor was this person a coal miner. This is not anthracosis or black lung. This is probably just a little bit of particulate matter which may have been inhaled by this person or might be an artifact or a remnant of the slide making. But I'm thinking because I see it scattered throughout that it might be some particulates that this person inhaled. So what can I ask you from this slide? Alveoli, bronchioles, and notice also next to the alveoli here, here, and I'll zoom in right there, these are capillaries containing red blood cells that I can see. Let's look at that under a little bit higher magnification. 
So focus your attention right here at this junction of several alveoli, and you can see some red blood cells there. This is a capillary, or actually more likely a capillary bed. Here's another capillary, capillary. I could see these scattered throughout, capillary right there, because they contain obvious erythrocytes, red blood cells, that went here to do what? Pick up oxygen, dump off carbon dioxide. Okay, here we have another long just to show you a different view. I can see all the alveoli out here, a fairly good sized bronchiole right there, and do not start thinking that all these things are capillaries. They are far too large for that. Those are in a microscopic sense, ginormous blood vessels. But if I go to higher magnification, maybe I can find a couple small capillaries. And right here I can see some. So I can see where there are red blood cells. These are capillaries. Capillaries literally smother these alveoli. So these are alveoli with small capillaries near them. Just moving to a different area here, here's a, an alveolus capillary right next door. Okay, let's do a little bit of a time warp here for this last histological slide for the respiratory system. What's this? A sheet of skeletal muscle. I bet you can see those striations if you look closely, which is the diaphragm. So a sheet of skeletal muscle fibers in this lab quiz is going to be the diaphragm. What we're looking at here is my high-tech ventilation model. I only call it mine, not because I invented the thing, which I did not, but because I have rebuilt this thing countless times over the years that I have been here. So I lay claim to it, it's mine, because I've rebuilt it enough times. This model represents thoracic ventilation, or what I like to call Boyle's Law in action. The changes in thoracic pressure that allow inhalation and exhalation. What we have here is a rubber diaphragm representing your diaphragm with a knob on it. So I can pull it down or push it up. Down, diaphragm contraction, up, diaphragm relaxation. Down will cause inspiration, inhaling. Up will cause exhaling. Now just about everybody understands the exhaling part. If my diaphragm moves up, it compresses my thoracic cavity, forcing air that was in here out. What gets some people a little bit is inspiration, inhaling. If I can reduce the pressure inside the thorax so that the pressure inside is less than the pressure outside, air will literally force its way into this small hole in the stopper, inflating these two balloons. People often don't believe me, so watch the high-tech model in action. The two balloons representing your lungs. As I pull down, notice they inflate. As I go up, notice they deflate. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. This relationship between volume and pressure of a gas, if the volume increases, the diaphragm moves down, the pressure decreases, outside air forces its way in. If the diaphragm moves up, the volume of the thorax decreases, pressure increases, air is forced out. I will do this a couple times a little closer to the camera so that you can see it.
Inhale, exhale. You can even hear it. High-tech ventilation model. Just reinforcing some stuff that you probably already learned in lecture. Next, we're going to do a little bit of what is called spirometry. The measuring of lung volumes, lung capacities, how much air can be moved in and out of a person's lungs. And you will notice that I have exactly the same laptop and power lab box set up here that we used for the electrocardiogram and the volume pulse exercise. This little gadget does a lot of things for us, a few of which we see here in 224, namely electrocardiogram, volume pulse, and spirometry. We call this digital or dry spirometry because there isn't any water moving around. You may have seen what are called wet spirometers. They're still in use where a person blows into a hose which moves a volume of water from one point to another. We don't have that here. We have a dry or digital spirometer which is right here on this laptop. And I have a mouthpiece here which I will exhale and or blow into which creates a deflection on this screen. I'll actually show you how that works once so you can see it. When I put my mouth on this thing and it has a filter built into it, we do not want, even though I'm the only one here, anybody spreading potentially dangerous pathogens around the room. I put the mouthpiece into the front part of my mouth, the area called the vestibule, which lives between my teeth and my gums. So the mouthpiece goes in there like so and then I exhale or blow into this hose and I see a deflection on the screen. So I'll perform an exercise something like this and we'll see a deflection here. Let me show you how that works. So what you're seeing here is a two-channel spirometer with channel one in control of the actual electronics and channel two recording my lung volume. That's this blue line. So as I start the spirometer, and now I'm going to put the mouthpiece in. I'm just going to give a big exhale once so you can see what happens. So watch closely. So you see this deflection right here. This represents how much air I blew out of my lungs. And the nice thing about a digital spirometer, if I just put my cursor at the bottom of this trough, it tells me how many liters that was. It's a little over two liters that I can see. So I can record my lung volume here with exhalation. So let's go through a couple exercises and get a couple lung volumes so you can see how it's done. One thing I will mention to you fine people is that every time you use a spirometer, I don't care if it's a wet one or a digital one like this, you have to re-zero it after each breath that you measure. These things are famous. They're notorious for drifting away from their zeroing point. So just so you can see how this works, after every data collection, I have to re-zero this spirometer before I could collect any more data. So it has to be re-zeroed every time, and the wet ones are the same. You have to re-zero them each time you use them because, man, do these things drift. So now let's take a look at the first thing we want to collect, which is a tidal volume. Tidal volume is how much air, the volume of air that can be moved in or out of the lungs with a normal resting breath. How do I record that using this spirometer? Well, here's my mouthpiece. 
So I will breathe in normally. Hear me inhale. But that was a little too forceful, wasn't it? So I'll get myself relaxed and I'll inhale normally and then exhale normally. <clears throat> My exhale will have to go into the spirometer mouthpiece. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, what I do not want to do is be looking at my screen. I will, you know, sort of get into a competition with myself and try to exhale even more. That happens all the time with people. So you never want your test subject or your guinea pig watching the screen while they do spirometry. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and start my re-zeroed spirometer. <clears throat> then I'm going to inhale a normal breath and exhale a normal breath. Now, what I can do, again, with my cursor, everyone, is just move it down to the bottom of the trough. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see the recording. What was my tidal volume right there with channel 2? 0.475 liters or 475 milliliters. A fairly normal tidal volume. You know, it tends to average about 500 for men. You can see that in your lab manual. So a tidal volume, I'll put my finger in there so maybe it'll focus a little better for you. 475 milliliters not too far out of what would be considered normal. Next up, what sort of volume do we want to get? Well, the expiratory reserve volume. The ERV, the amount of air that can be forcefully exhaled from the lungs after a normal, quiet exhalation. Now, I'm going to re-zero my spirometer And I know watching this, you do not appreciate how long it took me when we originally got this software to figure out how to do that very thing, re-zero it. So let's talk about the expiratory reserve volume. This is the volume of air that I could force out of my lungs after a normal quiet respiratory cycle. So I inhale normally, exhale normally, and then blow out as much as I possibly can. For a respiratory therapist or somebody doing respiratory therapy or spirometry, you sort of have to make like a cheerleader here for your person, your patient. You have to encourage them, blow it out as much as you can, blow it out. Like you're at some sort of, you know, college fraternity or sorority party and you're trying to beat the other team. So you want to really blow out as much as you can, but it has to be after a normal, quiet exhalation. So when you do this, you will breathe in and then breathe out, and then it's how much you have left that you can blow out. Expiratory reserve volume. How much can you blow out of your lungs after a normal exhalation? So now let's watch the spirometry. Okay, so we'll get ready to do this to collect the expiratory reserve volume. Now, if you hear a loud crash, see the camera jiggle around or something, that's just me passing out. And I only say that halfway kidding because those sorts of things do happen in spirometry. So if you don't have to be by yourself like I do right now, you always want another person because someone could get very lightheaded during spirometry and they might actually fall to the floor. I have in the past had situations where one lab student actually catches another one before they fall out of their chair. It's very rare, but it does happen. So, expiratory reserve volume. I'm going to start the spirometer, which I did re-zero. I'll get a couple normal cycles going here. 
And then I'm going to inhale, exhale normally, and then blow out as much as possible. <coughs> so, I'm going to stop right there. Let's check out my expiratory reserve volume. That was a pretty large one right there. I get a value of 2.35 liters. So 2,350 milliliters. That's pretty large. I don't think my expiratory reserve volume is quite that high. I think we'll run it again. What do I have to do between trials? I have to re-zero. Let's try this one again. So I start it running. Inhale normally. Exhale normally. And 1,459 milliliters, or 1,464 milliliters, I guess it is right there. So about one and a half liters, I don't know if you can read it there, not that it matters, you're not collecting the data, an expiratory reserve volume. Next up, we have the one everybody wants to get, which is a vital capacity. Now, I'm going to re-zero. Can't ever forget to do that. So the next respiratory volume we want to collect is the vital capacity. To get this one, you need to inhale as much air as you possibly can, then blow out as much air as you possibly can until you feel like you're just going to collapse. This is vital capacity. And you want to see how much air you can actually blow out of your lungs. So inhale as much as possible. Exhale as much as possible like that. So I'll go ahead and start the spirometer. Go ahead and start it. Here we go. And I will stop the spirometer. So that trial, my vital capacity, 2.148 liters, 2,148. We'll try it again, see if I can do any better. Because you would never, if you were actually collecting data, want just one trial, would you? You'd want several. Here we go. That one felt a little better, but I don't think it was any better. Look at that. 2.144 liters, 2,144 milliliters, the vital capacity, much air as I could blow out. Now, we could go around and around and practice and practice. You can develop uh, a little bit better habits for doing this, but I'm just trying to show you how it's done and how we collect some of these respiratory volumes. Okay, next we're going to perform some physiological experiments related to respiratory rate and hyperventilation to hopefully emphasize and show everyone that it's all about the carbon dioxide. So, all we need is a paper bag, which I have, 
a stopwatch, which I also have, and a test subject, which I am. So the first thing I need to do is to count my respirations in one minute as I sit quietly breathing. I will not force you to watch me do it for one minute, but I will collect the data and tell you what I get. So here we go. Okay, so my data was 13 breaths per minute. A normal resting respiratory rate. Next up, I'm instructed to hyperventilate for two minutes into open air. Hyperventilate, breathe in and out, <sighs> blowing that carbon dioxide out into open air. Now I would like you to think about what that means. As I hyperventilate into open air for two minutes, what will happen to my blood carbon dioxide level? it will continually fall, won't it? Then, after I hyperventilate for two minutes into open air, I again count my respirations for one minute. I'm not gonna force you to watch me do the whole thing. I can cut and edit to the end, but here goes two minutes of hyperventilation. Okay, now respiratory rates for one minute. Okay, that's my first inhale at 25 seconds. Five respirations, five breaths per minute. Think about that one. Okay, next up, number three, follow along with me in your lab manual. I will have your partner, moi, hyperventilate for two minutes into a paper bag held tightly over my nose and my mouth. Then, immediately afterward, I will count the ventilations or respirations in one minute, just like I did before. Hyperventilating not into open air, but into the paper bag. Think about what's happening here. I am rebreathing my own exhaled CO2. So over my two minutes of hyperventilation, what will now happen to my blood CO2 levels? They will continually rise, won't they? So let's try this. Hyperventilation for two minutes into a paper bag, then immediately after respiratory rate in one minute. Okay, there's two minutes.
Okay, 19 breaths per minute after two minutes of hyperventilation into a paper bag. Now remember, my baseline was 13 breaths per minute. After hyperventilating into open air, it went down to five. After hyperventilating into a paper bag, it went up to 19. Now it says wait two or three minutes, which we will do for the next test. Next we have some breath holding exercises. To finish out our physiology on respiratory rates, before we get to the conclusion questions. So don't worry, we will cover those conclusion questions. Now these breath holding exercises, this is a part of respiratory therapy where, as I mentioned before, I think the therapist or the person performing the therapy would act as a coach, encouraging their test subject, you know, hold your breath as long as you can, that sort of thing and watching for the person to actually get lightheaded, perhaps even lose consciousness. Somebody might pass out trying to do this. Since I am here in the lab by myself, I would say, if you see me go down, call emergency services, but by the time you see this, they will have long since probably found my carcass here in the A&P lab, and there wouldn't be anything you could do about it. So. Maybe you get to see Professor Alner pass out, maybe not, or perhaps I won't work quite that hard. But the first step, step four, asks you to have your test subject take a deep breath, pinch their nose, hold their breath as long as they can. I have my trusty stopwatch ready, so we'll do this one. Number four, take a deep breath, pinch my nose, and hold my breath as long as I can. Thirty-three seconds. Not too impressive, but considering the work I've been putting the old respiratory system through here today, so I'll jot that one down. Thirty-three seconds. Then it says wait two or three minutes, then have the subject exhale first and do the same thing. Now I want you to notice while we wait the two or three minutes, the first breath holding exercise I did, I took a breath in, just one, held my breath as long as possible. This time, I will exhale first. What is this that I'm blowing out? Of course, carbon dioxide. So this big exhale first, does what to my blood carbon dioxide levels? Makes them decrease. Think about that. And remember, it is all related to carbon dioxide. So you don't have to watch the waiting two or three minutes. I will just edit to that next breath holding exercise, number five, at the bottom of page six. Okay, this time, big breath in, big exhale, then I'm going to hold my breath as long as I possibly can.
52 seconds on that one. A noticeable improvement. Next, number six at the bottom of the page, I will once again hyperventilate for two minutes into open air, then try holding my breath again as long as I possibly can. I won't make you watch me hyperventilate for two minutes. That would be not too exciting, rather boring. But I will actually do it and then edit back in the breath holding. So hyperventilate into open air for two minutes. Okay, same thing after two minutes of hyperventilation. Okay, one minute, 27 seconds for that last experiment on page seven. So a definite improvement over the others. Let's get, continue on <clears throat> after I recover for a moment. The next step, in fact, the last one, asks me to exercise for three minutes by running in place, running stairs, something like that. I will not venture outside the labs, violating social distancing protocols, because there are a few people around, maintenance people and so on. So I'll stay here in lab, exercise for three minutes after I recover, and then do the same thing, hold my breath as long as possible. We'll record the time, and then immediately after that, we need to count the respirations and their depth to get a respiratory rate for one minute. Okay, so here begins the exercise, or at least as you will see it, because I'll edit right to it. Okay, same thing again. Six seconds. Twenty nine breaths per minute and fairly deep, at least on the front end of those. Now, I'm going to take a moment to recover because I was working pretty hard here in the lab, believe it or not. Then we will jump into our conclusion questions. OK, as an example for these conclusion questions here in lab five, I want you to picture yourself 
in a boat on the ocean. And not some sort of pleasant, you know, gently floating with the swells kind of meditative app that you might have on your cell phone right now that we could all probably use, wondering what's going to happen in the fall, etc. But not quite as peaceful as that. Maybe a little more emergent, sort of an emergency. So you notice I have the ocean, I have the boat, and here is our main character doing the stick version of the Home Alone thing because look at what we have, a hole in the boat. Outside water is coming in and because I have two different shades of blue, I can color the flood water entering my boat a different color. So as the water enters the boat, what does our main character do? Bails out the boat to keep the boat from sinking. So let's say there's this much water in the boat. It's just covering the bottom. Maybe they don't need to bail that fast. Maybe it's 10 buckets per minute that our main character has to throw out of the boat to keep the boat afloat. But the water rushes in a little faster now. So more water comes in. Now what does our main character have to do? They have to bail faster. So now maybe it's 20 buckets per minute to prevent the boat from sinking or overfilling with water. You understand how the more water that comes into the boat, the higher the rate of bailing needs to be. Think of this water as your blood carbon dioxide level. So as blood carbon dioxide levels go up, our need to respirate also goes up. So the relationship I want you to think about is as blood CO2 goes up, the need to respirate or our respiratory rate also goes up. In math, this is called a direct relationship. Some people get a little thrown off because blood pH is an inverse relationship to blood carbon dioxide levels. You may have learned about that in lecture. If you haven't, guess what? That's part of chapter 27 for us. But for lab, lab number five, as your blood carbon dioxide goes up, your need to get rid of the carbon dioxide goes up. I'm going to say this over and over again. Our need to respirate does not come as much from our need to bring in oxygen as it does from our need to <sighs> expel carbon dioxide. And I think our data supports that. So let's go through those conclusion questions. Hopefully the mental image of our person in a boat will help you more easily answer these conclusion questions. So I want you to answer these and watch the graphics that will appear right over my head or right across the front of my face, but you don't need to see my face anyway. And we'll go through them. So follow along with me in your lab manual. The conclusion questions on page seven. Number one, after hyperventilating in fresh air, blood carbon dioxide content, what, increases or decreases? Hyperventilation into open air. With every big exhalation, my blood carbon dioxide falls. So hyperventilating into open air, blood carbon dioxide level decreases. Circle that one. Highlight that one here in your lab manual. Number two, results obtained in step two under the collection of data indicate that a decrease in blood carbon dioxide levels is followed by an increase or decrease in the rate and depth of respirations. 
So we saw that my respiratory rate fell after I hyperventilated into open air. It went from 13 breaths a minute down to five. So the answer for number two is a decrease. A decrease in blood carbon dioxide levels is followed by a decrease, circle or highlight that one, in the rate and depth of respiration. Number three, hyperventilation into the paper bag causes blood carbon dioxide content to, so I'm rebreathing my exhaled air, which has a bunch of carbon dioxide in it, so the paper bag, every inhalation makes my blood CO2 go up. So three, hyperventilation into the paper bag causes the blood carbon dioxide content to increase. Circle or highlight that one. Number four, results observed in step three under collection of data indicate that an increase in blood carbon dioxide will be followed by a decrease or increase in the rate and depth of respiration. A quick consult of our data shows that after the paper bag, my respiratory rate went up to 19 breaths per minute from the baseline, we'll say, of 13. So that's definitely an increase in rate and depth of respiration. So the answer for number four, it's followed by an increase in the rate and depth of respiration. Number five. The subject was able to hold their breath longer when they did or did not hyperventilate first without a paper bag. Now I hope you're seeing the pattern here with these questions. We're essentially asking you the same thing over and over again about the relationship between blood carbon dioxide and a person's respiratory rate. The more carbon dioxide accumulates in my blood, the more I need to expel it. The less carbon dioxide that's accumulated in my blood, the less I need to expel it. A direct relationship, remember. So number five, the subject was able to hold their breath longer when they did hyperventilate first into open air. Number six, the explanation for the results observed in the preceding answer is that hyperventilation into open air, it doesn't say that, but that's what it means, hyperventilation into open air decreases the what? Blood CO2 content of the blood, so it takes longer to accumulate to a high enough to stimulate respiration. So as we hyperventilate into open air, Blood CO2 goes down. What follows is my respiratory rate goes down. Until that blood CO2 builds up to a high enough level forcing me to need to get rid of it. Now, why does my blood CO2 keep going up? Well, this is a metabolic byproduct, isn't it? Remember, in cell metabolism, we've got that pesky conversion step of pyruvates or pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA and the old Krebs cycle producing CO2. So as my tissues produce CO2, that CO2 moves into my blood, causing me to have a greater need for respiration. The more metabolism my cells do, the higher my blood CO2 content becomes. Number seven, based on the results obtained in these experiments, you can conclude that the rate and depth of respirations are inversely or directly related to blood carbon dioxide. Well, I think we already covered that one. Directly related. The more CO2 a person has in their blood, the more they need to respirate. Eight, normally when blood carbon dioxide level increases, the rate of respiration increases. 
I know we're asking you the same question over and over and over again because it's all about the carbon dioxide. So when a person's blood carbon dioxide goes up, their need to respirate goes up. When it goes down, their need to respirate goes down. If you think about what happened after my three minutes of exercise, how long could I hold my breath? Essentially not at all because all my muscle cells were producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide doing all this metabolism. So my blood carbon dioxide was very high to start with and staying high until such time as you recover from the exercise. So my need to respirate becomes very high. And wasn't my respiratory rate higher after the three minutes of exercise? Of course it was, not a surprise to anybody, but you have to remember it's driven by blood CO2, not blood O2.